evening. We're going to get started. My name is Mireya Burton, and I'm a counseling faculty member here at Evergreen, and I'm also the Enlace co-chair. The Enlace program, which was founded in 1983 at EBC, is composed of a team of college staff and community members with the mission of helping Chicano Latino students succeed academically. The program goals are to enable Latino students to successfully complete the academic core, which are English, math, and science, to guide Latino students through the mainstream of transfer and occupational courses in a timely manner. And lastly, to provide a positive academic experience that help Latino students achieve their maximum potential. The Enlace program, in conjunction with ethnic studies and anthropology instructors Arturo Villarreal and Gustavo Flores, welcome you to a lecture on Mesoamerican astronomy. Professor Arturo Villarreal has been teaching ethnic studies and anthropology at EDC for over 25 years. He is also an active member of the Enlace Program Coordinating Committee. Professor Villarreal is passionate about his subject areas and was instrumental, instrumental in creating courses at EBC in the areas of anthropology that continue to be taught today. He is also the co-author of Mexicans in San Jose. Professor Gustavo Flores is from Guatemala and of Mayan descent. He is a former EBC and Enlace student who transferred to UC Santa Cruz where he earned a degree in anthropology. He then went on to graduate school where he had the opportunity to work on excavations and archaeology in the Maya region and he is currently conducting research with Stanford University on Ohlone settlements in the Bay Area. Professor Flores teaches both culture anthropology and an introduction to prequel demo Mexico course here at EBC. For more information about the courses, please visit the Enlace table which is located in the lobby or the EBC website. He's teaching both of those courses either in the summer and pre Mexico in the fall. At the end of this lecture, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. But now, please, let's welcome Professors Villarreal and Flores. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, I chose this, this uh, image to open up with uh, because, <clears throat> well, amongst other things, it showcases this one astronomer peering from an observatory, and we know this is an observatory because of the stars that are around it. And uh, as he's gazing at the horizon, he's using his uh, measuring devices here. Um, and the one I want to focus on is the measuring sticks, and I'll get more into this a little bit later. And you see off to one side is the scribe, another specialty position. Of course, the scribe was writing down uh, these observations on deer skin or on bark. Uh, we know these uh, written uh, uh, books, texts, manuscripts as codices. Um, <clears throat> Right outside, some of you might have seen uh, that we have facsimiles, excellent, uh, uh, expensive facsimiles, right, uh, that we have uh, housed in our, our library, thanks to uh, Enlace, Title V, uh, who contributed uh, $10,000 annually to library acquisitions. Um, so there's a lot to this particular uh, mural that we're looking at here. Interesting. 
And uh, some of you probably say, well, popcorn, well, keep in mind, you know, the uh, corn did come from Mexico. And uh, by the way, uh, uh, stars were symbolized by these, uh, uh, these eyes, these half-shut eyes. So I want to point that out before we move on. Okay. Uh, well, Mesoamerica, uh, I don't want to assume that we all know what Mesoamerica is. Uh, Mesoamerica consists of Mexico and most of Central America. Uh, that, that would not include uh, like Costa Rica, Panama. But, uh, and the, uh, the major civilizations that emerged in Mesoamerica in order of appearance, right, chronological order of appearance, are the Olmecs. And by the way, the Olmecs do not get their due. Uh, this is the mother culture, the very first civilization, not just in Mexico, but all the Americas, uh, North America. Uh, one of the f six early original civilizations, right? Uh, people from the land of rubber. It all starts with them. They were the first, right? And they influenced everybody else who followed. So in chronological order of appearance, it would be the Olmecs. This is the pre-classic period, right? Followed by the Zapotecs in Oaxaca. And then we move on to the classic period, and that would begin with uh, Teotihuacan, the very first city in the Americas. Uh, and then we move on to the Maya. Keep in Maya, the Maya, the, the Maya <coughs> occupied an extensive uh, geographical location, all of southern Mexico and most of uh, Central America as well. Um, and then we move on to the post-classic period, and that would include um, <clears throat> civilizations such as the Mixtecs, the Aztecs, and the Toltecs up in, in Tula. So once again, uh, in order of appearance, Olmecs. We don't have information about Olmecs in relation to astronomy, uh, astrology, but uh, they were doing it. Uh, this we know. Zapotecs, from Oaxaca, uh, they gave us the very first known uh, writings and calendar in the Americas. Uh, moving on, Teotihuacan, uh, again, the very first city in the Americas, uh, more well uh, associated with the pyramids of the sun and moon there, right? Um, the Maya are. Uh, uh, arguably the greatest civilization of, of them all in the classic period. And uh, they're, they're more noted for their astronomy. They perfected the art. But again, it, it started with the, the, the Olmecs, right? Um, and then we move on to the Toltecs, Mixtecs, and, and Aztecs as well. <clears throat> so where do we find the information? Uh, in regards to astronomy, astrology, and we're even going to be talking archaeoastronomy uh, this evening as well. Where does most of this information come from? It comes from the codices. Once again, you see the facsimiles right outside the door of these uh, the codices. Um, the Spaniards, when they came in the 1500s, they destroyed thousands, the vast majority. Only about a dozen survived. And those dozen are associated with the Mayas, Mixtecs, and the Aztecs. <clears throat> also, uh, vases, ceramics, uh, roll out manuscripts, otherwise known as, right? Uh, a lot of information on these uh, ceramics. <coughs> on architecture, this is the hieroglyphic stairway in Copan, Honduras, the largest known. Uh, text in the Americas. It's nothing but text written on this particular stairway. The Bobo Vu, uh, post-classic period, Kish Maya creation story. The Chilam Balam, 17th, 18th century text associated with the Yucatec Maya, uh, Cosmo vision, uh, worldview. And uh, this is a, a text written by um, Anthony Aveni. And he's uh, the person who's uh, synthesized most of this information. 
This is considered like you know the, the modern day Bible, right? The Mesoamerican astronomy. Um, <clears throat> when Gustavo Flores here was a student in my Chicano culture class way back in the day, I recall a lecture in which I was lecturing about the Spanish conquest and what the Spaniards brought, you know, to the Americas. And there was a student who said, uh, yeah, and they brought higher education. <laughs> and it was, it was Professor Flores, who was a student at the time, who, you know, very, you know, matter of fact, he turned to him and said, uh, no, they did not. You know, there was already higher education here, right? And, and this is true. One such school was the Kalmeca, and I, I would like to read a little passage about this particular school, Aztec school. <clears throat> it was the most rigorous school, a temple run by a head priest who trained novice priests in a variety of subjects. Education in the Kalmeca included military, mechanical, astrological, and religious training. The head priest transmitted ritual, mythological, and astronomical information to the young students. It is also clear that the Aztec priests taught their students a great deal about sky watching. The students learned the names, paths, and powers of numerous stars, constellations, and celestial events. Among the most important celestial body was Venus, the morning star called Tlahuiscal Pantecutli. Venus was considered both dangerous and benevolent. Tianguitzli, or the marketplace, we know it as the Pleiades, was another crucial celestial pattern that the Aztecs taught their priests and populace. By the way, I just mentioned that the uh, Aztec called the Pleiades uh, the marketplace, Tianguitzli, uh, which leads me to uh, uh, a conversation I was having with uh, Celso Battaglia, a uh, professor of astronomy here, and he was mentioning that, you know, we name uh, certain constellations, uh, you know, based on our mythologies, right? And every culture, you know, has a different name based on their particular mythologies. And uh, having said that, you know, the, the marketplace was very important in, in, the, uh, in the Mesoamerican cosmovision. And so, um, therefore, the name Tianguitzli. This is uh, from a code, the Madrid Codex, probably the most well, you know, documented, uh, well-known uh, image of a Maya astronomer, and uh, as as if though he's plucking right the, the a star with his eyeballs. Uh, I have heard captions, uh, I've read captions uh, as such. And um, surrounded by um, glyphs, images, uh, and numbers associated with uh, the astronomical events that he's, uh, he's viewing. I would like to say a little bit now about the most well-known astronomer, most well-documented astronomer of them all in Mesoamerica uh, history. And that is a uh, Nesawalpili, otherwise known as the Fasting Prince. I'd like to read a little caption uh, written about him. On the night of 11 death, during the late summer of the year 13 Flint Knife, Nesawalpili, the Tlatuani, or chief speaker of the Aztec city of Texcoco, ascended to the roof of his palace with his royal astronomers to stargaze. After the afternoon rains had drenched the cities and towns around the five lakes in the middle of the Great Basin, the sky had grown clear, and the royal entourage knew that it would be a great night for watching the heavens. Like his famous father, Nesawalcoyot, the hungry coyote, the poet-philosopher king who had died in 1474, Nesawalpili drew knowledge and inspiration from the movement and relationships of certain celestial bodies. In fact, he based his most important governmental decisions and programs in part on the messages and patterns he and his astronomers discerned from the positions of stars, the lunar cycle, comets, and the movement of the sun and Venus along the horizon and across the sky. 
One historical account tells us that the Tezcopan uh, ruler was a great astrologer who understood the patterns of celestial bodies and invited other stargazers to his palace to exchange knowledge about the heavens. Together they would watch the stars and debate any questions that arose. On this particular night, Nesawalpini could have been watching the movement of the moon or, or the planet Venus or tracking the progress of a star cluster called the Tianitli marketplace, known to us as the Pleiades, as it made its way towards the zenith, its most vertical position in the sky. These observations were made in relation to the Aztec calendar, which was used to keep cosmos and society in synchronicity. <clears throat> this is an image from the Codex Duran uh, depicting the Aztec ruler Moctezuma. He was the ruler at the time of the uh, Spanish invasion. And this is an image of him viewing this mysterious comet that occurred uh, uh, right before the Spanish invasion. There were many omens foretelling of something to come, and this was one such uh, omen. And it reads, the chronicler, Father Diego Duran, tells us that Moctezuma, having observed the comet since midnight, went the next day to Nesawalpini to seek its meaning. Replied the king of Texcoco, your vassals, the astrologers, soothsayers, and diviners have been careless. That sign in the heavens has been there for some time, and yet you describe it to me as if it were a new thing. I thought that you had already discovered it, and that your astrologers had explained it to you. Since you now tell me that you have not seen it, I will answer you that that brilliant star appeared in the heavens many days ago. He goes on to give details of the frightful omens that soon after befell the unfortunate monarch. a nice little animated version of uh, Nesawalpili. Regarding Nesawalpili's method of observation, a century after the conquest, the, Hisp the Spanish historian Torquemada writes, I have seen a place on the outside of the roof of the palace, enclosed with four walls only a yard in height, and just of sufficient breadth for a man to lie down in in each angle of which was a hole or per perforation in which was placed a lance upon which was hung a spear. And on my inquiring the use of this square space, a grandson of his, a grandson of Nesawalpili, uh, who was showing me the palace, replied that it was for King Nesawalpili. When he went by night, attended by his astrologers to contemplate the heavens and the stars, whence I inferred that which is recorded of him is true, and I think that the reason of the walls being elevated one yard above the terrace and a spear of cotton or silk being hung from the poles was for the sake of measuring exactly the celestial motions. In other words, you know, Nesawalpini would be like in this coffin-like, you know, thing so that he could just, you know, barely fit in it so that, you know, he wouldn't be able to move, right? And there would be this, like, rod right above him with, like, you know, strings dangling, right, at intervals you know, so as to, to measure, right, movements. <clears throat> I'd like to now address another type of uh, observation uh, instrument, the cross sticks. And it's unclear as to the use of these cross sticks, but it's quite clear that they were used on many occasions, right? And uh, were they used as a centering device? Or might they have been turned a bit so that, you know, one was focusing on an object in the foreground and the other one in the background so as to measure the distance, you know, type of thing? It's quite, a, or maybe both. <coughs> you see uh, images of this on several codices. This is uh, from the Codex Bodley. Here you see the cross sticks with the star on it. Uh, that star on the uh, uh, specifying, you know, uh, well, specifically, you know, uh, inferring that this is the uh, astronomical observation uh, instrument, observing, you know, um, this image of the sun uh, held up by these props. 
<clears throat> Here's another image from the uh, Nuka Codex. And uh, again, this is an astronomer peering from the portal of a uh, observatory. And we know this is an observatory because of the stars all around it. Again, uh, using the cross sticks as a um, observing instrument. Modern day um, example. Now I'd like to end uh, my uh, part of the presentation uh, uh, on the moon, uh, specifically uh, a brief talk of, about the rabbit on the moon. Uh, whereas we uh, tend to see a man on the moon, uh, I'm sure you all know that there are civilizations out there that tend to see a rabbit on the moon. Um, one explanation as to why uh, it's a rabbit in the moon in Mesoamerica might come from the uh, creation story uh, of the fifth sun. Uh, in order for there to be a fifth world, a fifth sun, uh, there had to be somebody who would throw themselves in the, in the sacrificial fire to ensure that they would rise a new sun. And so it was Tecuchitecat uh, who was chosen, this brave warrior who was chosen to jump into the, this big bonfire to ensure that this new fifth sun would rise. So it would be the beginning of a new uh, world. And however, uh, he got cold feet and he wouldn't do it. So it was Nanawatsin, right, who actually, you know, like he, he was all uh, uh, ugly and, you know, sick and deformed, and, but he threw himself in. And having seen this, uh, the Kuchitek got, you know, garnered up enough strength and he finally jumped himself. He jumped in the fire himself. And the gods were waiting to see what was going to happen because this was, you know, unforeseen. And uh, two sons came up, and the, the, the gods were angry. The lords were angry that this happened. So one of them got a rabbit and threw it at the second one because uh, to ensure that it would not, you know, outshine the first. To ensure that there would only be one son. So the second one became the moon. This is an image from uh, the Codex Borgia. I think this is associated with the Mishtex, if I'm not mistaken. Here's an image of the Maya moon goddess, Ixchel, with the ever-present rabbit. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, a lot of this information you can get from bases, from ceramics, like this one that depicts the, uh, the Maya uh, moon goddess giving birth to a rabbit, in this case. And from the Florentine Codex, we have the, uh, the Aztec version of the rabbit on the moon. And that uh, ends my portion of, the, of this evening's talk. And uh, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Flores. We know that the Maya had a, a county system, really uh, one was represented by a dot, two was represented by two dots, and if it, uh, four by four dots, and five was a, a, a line, and zero was a shell. Uh, they, they had, Mesoamericans Americans uh, had sent many uh, calendars and then for example, they have they were cyclical calendars just like ours, um, and they have the hub uh, month symbols here. 
um, and the Tolkien date symbols, which are the Mayan calendars mainly are three main coded um, calendars. Um, the Solkin, which is 260 day cycle, which is a ceremonial calendar. The Hab is a solar cycle, um, calendar, which is 365 day cycle. And they have a long cal calendar, which is 5,125 year cycle since the creation of the, um, um, the creation story. And also they have many other cycles, like the Lords of the Night, which is nine day cycle, and they also follow Jupiter, Saturn, uh, which is an 819 day cycle. Uh, we can see this in their monuments. For example, in this monument, which is called the Stella, uh, have the, their, their calendar here uh, connected to their creation story, mainly. Um, and they have also, we can't really see that number, but they have really long numbers, like they're really uh, mythical numbers. They go into infinity, you know. They were calculating numbers way beyond uh, our way of thinking uh, uh, today. Like, I mean, I can't even say this number <laughs> to tell you the truth, but they did have many cycles, uh, calendars that represented, that were connected to their um, everyday, um, day, right, uh, doings. Uh, uh, it's also represented in the art in a hieroglyphic text. Um, for example, they have celestial symbols. For example, the sun, they have the moon, the symbol of the moon, Mars, Venus, the night, darkness, uh, sky, and the cross band. Um, and this uh, example here of a sarcophagus made of a Kinich Hanab Pakal which is one of the uh, lords of uh, Palenque. We see in the uh, outside of this sarcophagus, they have many of the symbols that I just mentioned previously. Uh, they have a uh, Venus, Mercury, Mars, um, Moon, and some people think that uh, also Jupiter is in there and Saturn. Um, this is one of, uh, a picture just of the. Uh, of, of the sarcophagus. Uh, it's really uh, engraved in, into limestone, mainly. Um, now I want to get into more into the building alignments in place of light and shadow. A lot of the uh, buildings were really meticulous place in certain um, um, places to catch the Senate or a summer solstice or it could be a winter solstice or the equinox. For example, here, uh, this picture is from uh, Watsaktung, uh, uh, Maya city, and we can see that uh, the structures are aligned to capture, for example, the summer solstice on the, on the left right there, the equinox and the winter solstice from another pyramid, if you sit there. So this is really integrated to their, to, uh, their cosmi cosmology and, and uh, world, worldview, mainly. Um, here's uh, one of the famous uh, observatories. Uh, it's in Chichen Itza. Chichen Itza, it's up in the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, it's called Caracol. And the Caracol, uh, if people have been, definitely really analyzed this um, and done observations, and they have noted that if you sit in a certain area, you'll be able to see, for example, uh, Venus. Uh, sets at a maximum uh, declination at a certain time of the year. Um, and several other um, celestial bodies up in the uh, celestial sphere. This picture here is from a, a, a equinox um, in DC Beach Altum, which is also in the Yucatan uh, area of uh, uh, Mexico. And you can see here that uh, the, the light of uh, the equinox of the sun goes right through this temple that uh, is called the Temple of the Seven Dolls because they were actually seven dolls were uh, discovered inside this temple so it's named after, uh, after that discovery. But this is uh, mainly uh, what they were doing. They were aligning their buildings uh, according to, to uh, 
to what was going up in the, in the, in the heavens. Um, another really fascinating uh, building, um, a structure is the El Castillo, which is in Chichen Itza also. And it's, uh, this uh, particular building, you can see at uh, certain times of the year, for example, in uh, spring and the fall equinox, that a serpent, if you could see on this, that's this side here, a serpent, uh, this, it looks like the shadow of a serpent is um, undulating into the underworld. And it happens uh, twice a year. Also this temple uh, has four sides. Each side has uh, 91 steps. Um, if you add all the sides, that's 364. In the top of this building, there's an extra step, and that makes it 365, which is a calendar, a solar calendar. So mainly this structure here was used to, to uh, capture uh, cyclical uh, seasons and was really instrumental. You can actually go ahead, uh, if you ever want to travel to Yucatan and visit Chichen Itza, you can be able to see this live at certain times of the year. Um, this is just uh, information about the Senate, uh, which is the Senate is when the, the sun goes up high and, and it's the highest uh, at that time of the year. And we have um, other places like in Teotihuacan. It depends where you are. Uh, the uh, Senate is different. Um, so if you for example, if you were uh, standing on a on a, a pyramid, you'd be able to kind of see the summer solstice, the equinox, and the uh, winter solstice um, happen at certain times of the year. And the Senate, the Senate, it goes right through the tropics, um, and it and it all these uh, countries experience the Senate at certain time of the year. Um, for example. We have uh, Copan, we have uh, Waxactum, Palenque, and Teotihuacan, and Isapa. All those uh, cities are aligned to capture the Senate, and we know that because there's buildings that actually show that. Um, and and uh, we, I mentioned that there, the Mayans have a calendar that's uh, 260 days which is a ceremonial calendar. And this particular calendar captures, goes from like the winter solstice, 260 days all the way to the Senate. And that's the ceremonial um, um, calendar. And then if you go from the Senate to the summer solstice, that's 105 um, days, which makes it 360 days. And this is correlated to the uh, seasons, meaning to dry season and wet season, where you're able to uh, actually uh, uh, plant for uh, when you're going to harvest or when you're going to actually plant your, your, uh, your um, uh, say, corn, for example. Okay. So this is an old picture, an old drawing of the Otiwakan, and as you see here on the background there, that's a, a Cerro Gordo. And on the right side, we have the Temple of the Sun. And on the uh, back in the, the, the end there, that's the Temple of the Moon. And then the Teotihuacan had an a, a observatory, uh, which is a chamber, mainly that is set right over here, right near the Pyramid of the Sun that uh, captured the Senate passage into uh, what they call the Camera Astronomica de, de, de Otihuacan, which was an astronomical chamber where it captured the Senate. And it landed right on the altar here, right in front of a, a, a monument that uh, I'm, I'm sure that will, someone that will get in here will be a priest, a shaman, um, that will transfer information to their people. Same things are happening in, you can see the same phenomena in Xochicalco, which is in Morelos, 
They have uh, also a astronomical chamber where they have a, a tube. In that tube, uh, the light goes in at the certain time of a Senate passage once it's passing through, and it shines a light in through this cave. Let's say, uh, I've seen videos when, uh, I've never been to this place, but I, I've seen videos when they sh put something underneath the, li underneath the light, and it, it creates like an optical illusion that it highlights. If you put a red eye on, artifact on, on here, the whole chamber turns into uh, namely uh, red. So it's, it creates like an optical illusion, and, and it's um, also happening in other places, like in Monte Alban, Oaxaca. We see the same thing in uh, one of the observatories that they have. Um, it's building uh, J. Um, also, we see other monuments uh, along the, the Mayan uh, region, like these towers that are placed mainly along the Senate. And you see these towers, mainly Torres, but uh, those are towers that the Senate goes right through it, and they have um, uh, lined up towers to indicate um, the Senate. And that was really uh, the changing of seasons, meaning. Um, here's an, uh, uh, another um, example in Copan, Honduras, which uh, they're actually is right aligned, the stella is aligned with the celestial, the, the, the senate, the sunrise, the senate. And it's an actual picture of uh, Silvanus uh, Morley in the 1920s uh, demonstrating the alignment of the agricultural cycles in the senate passage. Now I want to turn on into uh, more of a, a focus into Palenque, uh, observations of uh, a friend of mine that uh, did observations for four years with a couple of his colleagues and captured really good uh, information. This is Palenque, and Palenque is it's really a huge city. Palenque has been uncovered about 15% of the city, mainly in the yellow. That's where most of the excavations have been done. And this is a picture of Palenque. Uh, we have a temple of descriptions right here, temple of the sun. And those are, um, I'm going to talk more mainly about the temple of the inscriptions. As like I saw you previously, it was uh, about Kinich uh, Hana Pakal. He was, he's buried in the temple of the inscriptions. Well, he was buried now. He was uncovered and now is in the Museum of Mexico. So this is a close-up of the city. Um, that's the temple in the description on the left side over there. And this is just an um, um, image where it depicts where Kinich Hana Pakal was buried. Kinich Hana Pakal was a, a lord of Palenque. He came into, uh, into, let's say, into power when he was 13 years old, and then he, he was there for mainly 68 years, uh, and his son actually was the, uh, the one that built this temple, and he would, he bur they buried him in this temple in the inscriptions. Um, here's the sarcophagus again. So if we now, if we turn into the equinox, um, it, it, for example, here, we can see that uh, it, when the equinox happens, it highlights just right on top of the, the temple. In the night hours, which is the lowest points of the sun, um, we can see an image that when the sun right goes through this window, it highlights right on this spot here, which indicates if somebody's actually observing this, the sun at that time, he doesn't really have to even go outside and know that the night art is happening at this time, which is significant. And they can probably stand here and, and, and they can cast the, 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 the light. Um, 
my friend, um, his name is Dr. Powell, um, Christopher Powell, did uh, several um, demonstrations of how would have been in that past. Um, for example, with the summer solstice, the summer solstice is different than the night art because it goes right through the building. The light of the sun like, goes through the building. Well, here's another representation of that. And it, it, it's really fascinating because the light from that goes through that building all the way to the top of this structure here. With, in this structure, which is this one here, now it's been reconstructed. But on that side, on that, on that layer there, there used to be a, a monument. A lot of these monuments were made out of uh, glitter. And if uh, a light will shine into those monuments, it will really create a, an optical illusion and indicate that is the light at the certain time of the year, which is the summer solstice at this, in this uh, uh, presentation, uh, that uh, it's really significant. This is a representation of uh, a summer solstice. Uh, they did some, uh, um, uh, uh, so this guy here, he's casting the light at that time of the summer solstice. Here's another, uh, the night art in the summer solstice. Um, the summer solstice was really significant for many uh, Mesoamericans. And for example, uh, at this time in this, uh, actually, you know, temple, there's like a plaque where there's actually, they're holding a, a baby when the solar solstice is happening, and it's maybe introduction to maybe he's is going to be the next uh, lord of Palenque. And here is a, a picture of a reenactment of that possible um, uh, event that happened really in like in 674 AD and they replicated that. There's another shot of this rep, um, replication of this event. Um, and for example here, this is mainly like almost in a, also in an observatory because from this you can actually see the sunrise, the Pleiades, and the sun, and the moon. Sorry. Um, there's another picture of a um, moon um, over the Palenque. Um, so now I want to get into the present and the continuity of um, this cosmo vision through ceremonies that there's still uh, many uh, Mesoamericans practice. In this case, this is the Mayans the Watsa Kik Bats, which happens every 260 days. So it happens twice a year. And um, they're honoring uh, the end of a cycle. And I just kind of wanted to uh, mention to you that I'm actually, I'm from Guatemala, and I, when I used to go and visit my, my grandma up in a remote area where there was no electricity, we used to use, my, my grandma used to say, hey, it's the full moon. And we'll, we'll just take a walk and go and visit family. So it tells you that there's still a lot of those old traditions, old uh, way of using the light of all these, all these celestial bodies up in, in the heavens. is still being used for, for daily activities. If, uh, let's say, for example, the, uh, the, uh, uh, you, there's a full moon, indicates that's going to be a good harvest, for example. And I, I want to end up with a, a poem uh, from, a, from a, a, a person, uh, uh, he's a Mayan descent, uh, his name is Humberto Akbal from uh, Momostenago, Guatemala. And he wrote this poem, and when I read it, uh, it really connected to me, and it, it gave me this understanding that People are still practicing old ways, 
and there's a continuity of this knowledge still within the people of the Mesoamerica. For example, now I'm going to recite it in Spanish and then I'll go over it in, into English. I translated that into English. So, it goes, uh, a veces soy jaguar, corro por barrancos, salto sobre peñascos, trepo montañas, miro más allá del cielo, más allá de la tierra, platico con el sol, juego con la luna, arranco estrellas y me las pego en el cuerpo, moviendo la cola, me echo sobre el pasto, con la lengua de fuera. So, this one really kind of connects to this idea of the cosmovision because as I translate it, it says, sometimes I am a jaguar, I, I run through ravines, leap over peaks, climb mountains, I see farther than the heavens, farther than water, farther than the earth, I speak to the sun, play with the moon, I grab stars and attach them to my body, twitching my tail, I rest on, on the grass, panting. So, this is uh, my presentation, and, and I wanted to end that with this because it really connects to their landscape, to their way of speaking to the sun to get energy, sunlight, to have a good crop. So, thank you.